Um, all right, so I think we are live, and um, yeah, so apologies again for forgetting to post the topic of the lecture. Um, today I decided to uh, focus on a specific class of NLP tasks and um, go over how uh, this class, uh, question answering, was approached prior to the introduction of models like BERT, um, and then also go over how we uh, deal with um, these tasks in the modern paradigm of transfer learning using models like BERT. Uh, so I hope to emphasize in this lecture how simple um, the, the task of question answering has become from a modeling perspective. We really don't have to do anything beyond the, um, the usual uh, feed our question into BERT along with some external info and add a classifier on top to predict the answer. Um, so later on in this lecture we'll go over some more complicated types of question answering tasks that don't nicely fit this paradigm, and um, that'll be a kind of precursor to following weeks in which um, we'll go over more complicated models that are suitable for those those tasks. Uh, whoops. Okay, so before we start, um, I wanted to go over some stuff from last time. So uh, we published the homework zero grades finally. Uh, everyone did great. The average was super high. Uh, so good job on that. Um, homework one, uh, we're finishing up. Uh, it's been, uh, as you'll see, it, it's a fairly extensive coding homework. So uh, there's still some final tweaks to be made. So you can look out for that um, sometime in the next few days. Also, we hadn't actually covered all of the content for homework one, which relies heavily on BERT and um, also some topics from next Monday's lecture that um, that'll be useful. So uh, yeah, we'll give you two weeks, maybe a little more to complete uh, homework one, but you can expect it to be far more coding intensive than um, homework zero was. Okay, so uh, we've also got all your project proposals. Um, we're aiming to give you all pretty detailed feedback uh, sometime over the next couple of weeks and uh, hope to get all of that out by early October. So you'll have some um, information from myself and the TAs as to what you can improve or things you should watch out for when you're actually working on your um, projects. So uh, yeah, you can look out for that. Um, and also the exam, um, I realized on the schedule we had scheduled it for October 5th. Uh, that's based on the pace at which we're covering material just way too soon to get to any of the more interesting stuff that we'll be talking about over the next couple weeks. So uh, I decided to push the exam back to the end of October where um, we'll have a lot more topics, potential questions um, to ask, and um, yeah, so you can expect to hear more about that uh, towards the end of October. Um, we also do, uh, or have done in the past, uh, have a review day, like um, the, the class before the exam is, is scheduled, so I can plan to do one of those if that would be of interest to, to all of you. I'll also uh, sometime in the next couple days put um, old exams from previous iterations of uh, related NLP classes up on Piazza so you can check those out. Um, but like I said at the in the first lecture of this uh, this class, the the exam that you all are going to get will probably look very different from um, previous exams because we have to uh, account for the whole remote aspect of it and um, you know we obviously like to minimize um, cheating as much as we can so um, yeah more details on that soon and finally um, thanks to whoever the anonymous person was that posted all these uh, tips on how to improve notability usage on the anonymous form I did see those 
uh, I'll try and um, take those into account when I'm using the iPad in the future. All right, and like uh, usual, if you have any questions about logistics uh, or um, the material that we'll be covering in this lecture, please post them in the, the chat box. All right, so let's uh, move on to our topic of the day, which is question answering. Um, so I wanted to first go over uh, at a very high level, how this task used to be approached um, before neural networks kind of took over NLP. And um, the way in which we used to solve these tasks is we would design a bunch of different modules that are each responsible for a small subcomponent of the overall task. So if I had this uh, question, who wrote the song um, Kiss from a Rose? I might first do some sort of low-level analysis of this question. So I could convert it to a part of t speech tag sequence. I could get a parse of this sentence that tells me it's uh, syntactic structure. I could um, detect all the entities in the sentence, in the question. So a kiss from a rose, I might want to know that that's a named entity uh, so I can maybe look it up in some external knowledge base. Um, and so I would do all these low-level processing tasks. And once I've had extracted all the information I think is important from this uh, question, I would then get to a query formulation stage. So if you assume that you have access to some external database or source of uh, documents and you want to simply query this uh, external source of knowledge with whatever representation you've derived from your question, um, you, you can have a separate module that turns this text question into uh, a properly formatted query for this task. And uh, you can then use that query to search over some knowledge base or something like Wikipedia, doing string matching or some more complicated stuff to find a bunch of candidate answers. Um, so once you have some answer candidates, and this could be a very noisy process, I might be left with hundreds or thousands of candidate answers after this stage, I might want to go back and try and retrieve evidence for each of these candidates. So maybe I have a candidate like the Beatles, and so I'm now going to reformulate my query to say something like, um, a Kiss from a Rose, a song by the Beatles, and then query my knowledge so source again for um, pieces of text that support that particular query. So this is one way in which I could kind of rescore all these candidates um, given the question. Um, a second type of processing that I might want to do is uh, figure out what the answer type is of this question, right? So that's very important when I'm trying to rescore candidates. Uh, in, in this case, I might predict that the answer type of this question is a band or a music artist. And so anything that was generated in this candidate uh, answer generation phase that is not fitting that answer type can be filtered out. Um, and using all of these different modules working together, I can form a final ranking, which hopefully will eventually produce the correct answer. Um, but the thing to emphasize is that each of these modules, these boxes here, and this is, again, a very simplified version of what um, something like IBM Watson uh, used to solve Jeopardy questions. They had many, many more modules. Each module is its own component that needs to, have, to be tuned separately and you know, improving one of the modules may cause some issues uh, higher up in the pipeline. So it's a very delicate process of tuning these QA systems. Um, and uh, yeah, this is this was the state of QA even you know when IBM Watson was developed, and for a few years after that. Uh, so it really relied on a lot of engineering to um, optimize all these modules separately and also uh, together as a single system. So uh, when deep learning kind of came along, um, uh, researchers started to wonder how many of these modules can be replaced with a neural network that uh, you know can can learn to perform the functions of these modules without being explicitly designed to have a certain functionality, right? And uh, eventually the, the goal became 
going completely end to end, meaning I have a question, I have a neural network, and I have an answer. There are no other modules, uh, external modules in this um, in this system, and my neural network, the parameters are learned um, through the loss function that I get when um, it makes a prediction of an answer and it's wrong. It gets an error signal that's backpropagated into the parameters of the neural network. So this conceptually is much easier to maintain, right? I have a single neural network and I don't have to, um, you know, try and tinker with various subcomponents of this network. Um, I can, I, I just have a single model that I can optimize and make my QA performance better. On the other hand, an issue with neural networks is that they're not very interpretable, right? So I can't just look at the millions or billions of weights in my model and come to an understanding of why it's predicting a particular answer. Whereas um, in this case, I have uh, intermediate outputs at each one of these stages that I can use to kind of interpret how, why the model decided to predict a particular answer. So there is a trade-off, but um, practically speaking, the neural network models uh, started to produce much better results than um, the traditional QA pipelines. And so um, people have kind of uh, built off this direction um, moving forward over the past uh, five to 10 years. So, so far I've been discussing QA like a pretty general task, but there's really many, many subtasks that are distinct within the umbrella of question answering. Uh, that require different kinds of modeling decisions and um, actually have different, uh, completely different formats. So the one that we just saw, like who wrote the song Kiss from a Rose, um, that's an instance of factoid question answering where the answer to the question is a single entity or numeric, right? Um, these are most Jeopardy style questions or trivia questions look like this. Um, and these are important if uh, in use cases where you know a, a user might want to um, just refresh their memory or or learn a fact, but they they don't encompass um, more complicated questions that require a greater deal of reasoning on the part of the model and also uh, require the model to actually produce an answer um, that is maybe a sentence long or multiple sentences. Um, in contrast to factoid QA, we have uh, non-factoid QA where the answer is not just a single entity, but it's free text, right? So um, an example of this is why is Dracula so evil, right? And so you can't just answer this with one entity, right? That doesn't make sense. Um, you might want to answer it with a couple sentences or a paragraph or so on. And so this style of QA is much more difficult. We will be covering some instances of um, these tasks and also what kind of models we currently use to handle them um, in a couple of weeks. So, um, so these, these are like very two high level categorizations, but um, even within a QA, uh, I within either one of these um, types, there, there are many uh, subtypes sub of question answering. So um, one is semantic parsing question answering in which you might have a database, like a SQL database of facts um, or triples, uh, and you want to um, kind of ask questions about that database. So um, if I had, you know, some sort of ridiculous database that uh, had information about people and how many um, victims they bit, then I could ask a question like, how many people did Dracula bite? And maybe this question would be converted into a sort of SQL statement, executed over the database, and an answer is returned. So the modeling framework for semantic parsing QA is a little different than normal factoid QA, in particular because you can't really treat this as a um, supervised classification problem like you can do with many instances of factoid QA. You actually, in most cases, don't have any um, supervision in your training data over the ground truth logical form or SQL statement. So the machine learning behind semantic parsing is more uh, interesting from a research perspective. 
Um, today in this lecture, we'll cover reading comprehension QA in a quite a bit of detail as this is the subtask of QA that's kind of dominated NLP research over the past couple of years. It's resulted in uh, many modeling advances, which kind of culminated in BERT and BERT style variants. Uh, and we'll sort of go over a history of these, uh, these models in this lecture. But in reading comprehension, you're given a document and you're asked a question specifically about that document. And the assumption in this uh, set of tasks is that the answer is a span of text within that document. So there are other types of QA, like community QA, if you look at Yahoo Answers or Quora or something, those are instances of uh, community-based QA tasks. And there's also um, visual question answering where you have a question about an image. Um, so yeah, these are the some different types of question answering. There have since been you know, many other types of uh, QA tasks proposed in, in the community. All right, so before I jump into reading comprehension, we have some questions. Uh, what are the different answer types? Are these some standard categories? Who decides them? That's a great question. It really just depends on who is designing the system and what kind of supervision they have. Um, so in, in a kind of factoid QA case where you know that many of your answers will be entities, it makes sense to use a categorization of entities like people, places, organizations, um, objects, or, or whatever. Um, but different data sets have different levels of this kind of categorization and a different granularity. Um, and we'll, we'll look a little bit more at this when we talk about co-reference data sets and uh, what kind of categorization um, co-reference and named entity recognition data sets use for um, giving us some information about the entities. But uh, yeah, it, it really depends on um, who is designing the system, how many resources they have, and uh, how much effort they're willing to put into labeling the answers. Um, okay, so another question, how would the objective function for non-factoid QA look? Yeah, so we've actually seen uh, the common objective for non-factoid QA. It's essentially treated as a language modeling problem, right? So I have a, an input question. I have, say, a paragraph or something. That's my answer. I'm going to train a conditional language model, much like the machine translation systems we've seen, to generate left to right each word of that um, answer in my ground truth uh, uh, training data set. Um, there are issues with the setup, which we'll talk more about when we get to open domain, long form question answering. Um, but that's the, the base objective. So you, you already have seen the um, objective function that's used for all of these tasks that require you to actually generate text. What is the use case of the language model in community based question answering? Again, if your task requires you to um, generate an answer as opposed to just select an answer from uh, existing text, like retrieve a span from a document or something like that, or just uh, you know train a classifier to predict a particular entity out of a large set of entities. Um, if your model requires you to generate text, then you're going to need to use a language model to do that. So um, that's probably the main usage of language models in that setup. OK, so let's uh, now focus on reading comprehension. As I mentioned before, this has been by far the most influential in terms of model development and even just popularizing neural network models within NLP beyond simple text classification tasks like sentiment, like um, in the examples we've been looking at up, up till this point. So the main data set, the, the very, uh, not the first one, but the first one that really uh, attracted a lot of attention from the research community and got many people interesting, interested in building um, question answering models was SQUAD, the Stanford question answering data set. And in this data set, you have a short paragraph from Wikipedia, like the one here. And um, you also have uh, a question about that passage. And it makes one more assumption that the answer to this question is a span of text within that paragraph. So this is 
you know, very constrained compared to the general case where if I did not have this paragraph at all and I asked this question, that would be much harder for a model, right? Because then it would probably have to retrieve some evidence text and then do this uh, kind of uh, span selection from that evidence to produce an answer or generate the answer itself. But this, uh, this squad data set is really focused on given a small uh, evidence document, can we figure out what part of that document is most relevant to the answer uh, to the question? And it, it assumes that the answer to the question occurs in the um, paragraph. So there's no um, there are instances of questions that are unanswerable from the paragraph. We'll talk a little bit more later on about um, the second version of Squad, which did address um, directly this concern. Okay, so I wanted to take you through, uh, at a high level, one of the um, pre-BERT models that was used to solve this data set, um, just to uh, give you an introduction as to what kind of modeling setup is used to predict the answer in these span-based tasks, because we're going to be using the same setup in BERT, just with a, a different architecture um, and a lot more parameters shared. So again, we have a paragraph, we have a question, and our answer is a span of text within that paragraph. And really what we're going to do at a high level is consider all possible tokens in this passage as either the start point or the end point of the answer span. So you can think of this as for every single word in this uh, paragraph, I'm going to make two predictions using a softmax layer. So have two separate softmax layers. One is going to predict, is this word super the start of this answer span? And the second classifier will predict, is this word super the end of the answer span? And so I'm going to make these two predictions for every single one of the words in this passage. Um, for all of the words that are outside of the answer span in our training data, we're going to predict no, right? The, this um, token is neither the start nor the end of the answer span. But when we get to Denver, um, our start span classifier is going to have supervision to predict this is the start of the answer span. And when we get to Broncos, we're going to predict that this is the end of the answer span. So this is how training works. And um, if you think about it at a pretty high level, how, how we actually estimate these probabilities is we first get a vector representation of our question. So we've looked at a number of ways in which we could do this, right? So given this question, um, which NFL team represented the AFC at Super Bowl 50, I could do a number of things. I could put an RNN over this question and take its final hidden state as the, um, the representation of that question. I could simply element-wise average the uh, word embeddings for all of the words in this question. I could run Elmo over this question and take its token level representations and somehow compose those. Um, and yeah, I could run this thing to, through BERT, right? And look at the CLS token, and maybe that's a good representation of the question. So we've seen many different ways of getting a, question, a representation for a given piece of text. And in this equation, you can use any one of those to um, get some vector Q that represents the question. Next, we have a vector representing each of the uh, words in the, the paragraph. So here that's called the query text and represented by P sub I. Um, and so we have some vector representation of every word. We could, again, um, if you go back to here, we could run an RNN over this entire paragraph and take each hidden state of the RNN as uh, a representation of that token. We could ignore the RNN completely and just think of the word embeddings of these words as the um, P sub I's in this equation. Uh, of course, that has an issue, right? The, the issue is that the paragraph hasn't been composed together. So one word embedding is um, ignorant of all of the other words in this paragraph, which is why we would like to use something like an RNN. RNN. Um, 
But yeah, we've also seen how we can go beyond just training RNNs from scratch as composition functions. We could use something like Elmo to get contextualized representations of every word. We could use something like BERT and look at its final hidden states to um, get representations of these words and so on. So the same kind of thing applies to getting both of these P and Q vectors. And then they just had uh, a weight matrix, W sub S and W sub E, which you can think of as the weight matrix in your softmax layer. It's projecting um, this uh, uh, kind of uh, paragraph word and query representation, the dot product into um, some space where you can measure whether it's uh, uh, the, actually the start of the, the answer span or or not, so you, you get just a single scalar score for each of the um, words in the, the paragraph. So, right. Um, and one important thing that you might be wondering at this point is uh, what exactly do I do at test time, right? Because currently the way I've set this up is that I have two separate classifiers and their predictions are independent of each other, right? There's nothing in this estimation of p sub start that relies on the position of the um, the end of the answer, right? And similarly, p n does not depend on the starting position of the um, answer span. So what do we do at test time? One, one easy way we could think of solving this is just um, treat the uh, probability separately. So I can run the start classifier over every single token in the pa paragraph. I can take the token that had the highest probability for the start um, token, and I can just consider that as a start of my answer span. And then I can do the same thing for the end token, right? So I can look at all of the tokens in the paragraph, look at the probability predicted by the end classifier, and then pick the one that has the highest probability out of all the tokens in the paragraph. But this approach has some major issues, right? Um, so at this point, I would like ask the class, but I guess I'm not going to do that here because of the annoying stream delay. Um, but the, the issue is that I could run into situations where the end span, the end token is predicted to be even like before the start span that was predicted, right? Since these are completely independent, I could have um, invalid answer spans, right? The same token could have the highest probability for start and end. Um, and I could have all sorts of weird uh, issues here. So what we generally, and also like, I, I wanna avoid cases where, you know, the, the start span is the first word of the paragraph and the end span is the last word of the paragraph, which effect means the entire paragraph is the answer to the question, right? So I might have um, some knowledge, prior knowledge about what these answers look like. Maybe they're on average very short and they're like two or three words names of people, etc. So I don't want to have huge um, answer spans. So in practice, what we do is we um, look at every single span that uh, you, can, you can make in the, um, in, in the paragraph, and you multiply the probability of that span having the start probability and the end probability associated with the start and end positions of that span. Um, and you can make this faster by just filtering out the spans that are too long, that you think are way too long to be an answer to these questions. Um, so you could, for example, set a limit that my answer spans can't be more than a sentence long or something. So then you just consider all spans of up to a certain length and multiply the start and end probabilities uh, associated with the, the boundary words of that span. And at test time, you pick the span with the highest product of these start and end probabilities. OK, so this general approach of solving these reading comprehension QA tasks is exactly the same approach we're going to look at when we move to models like BERT. Um, we're just replacing the way in which we get the representation of the paragraph and the query. And we're importantly not going to learn these from scratch like all of these previous models are doing, but we're going to fine tune our BERT like we discussed um, last, last video. So before we get to how we use BERT for this task, I wanted to just show you an overview of a couple different architectures that had been proposed prior to 
the advent of transfer learning that um, just so you can get a sense of how complex uh, this this kind of modeling sub area was um, in this model the Stanford attentive reader we have an LSTM here on the left a bi-directional LSTM for um, getting a representation of the question we're taking a weighted sum of the hidden states to get a single vector we're doing some attention between this set of LSTMs and another set of LSTMs that we're using to encode the passage. Um, there's a lot of uh, information, like low-level linguistic information, parts of speech, um, named entities. We see here Beyonce is marked with this person tag. All of these things are embedded, passed through RNNs, LSTMs. We have um, finally some combination at the top, and we have our start and end classifier at every token. So um, all of the parameters here are being trained from scratch other than the um, word embeddings, which are initialized with uh, pre-trained word embeddings from Glove or WordDevec or something like that. Um, but overall, there are a lot of things being learned from scratch. The whole composition process uh, is being learned from scratch here with these LSTMs, these recurrent connections. And as we've discussed in the prior lectures, we generally want to avoid um, as much as possible learning things uh, from scratch from our downstream data set, right? Because those are always going to be smaller than the uh, amount of unlabeled data that we have. And we know that language models learn very powerful representations of um, text without having any additional labels. So um, why do we want to force our QA model to learn how to all these general properties of language as well as how we actually extract question, uh, I mean, answers out of these passages? Um, another model that was commonly used for the squad style question answering was BIDAF. Um, essentially, these models are focusing on um, adding as much attention as possible within the question and the paragraph. So here you see there's two types of attention. We're using the query, the question representation to um, augment the context, the paragraph, the wor word embeddings in the paragraph. We're also using those vectors from the paragraph to get a more contextualized query representation. Um, then we pass this through several recurrent layers. And finally, at every token, we predict the start and end span. So the same concept of predicting start and end um, at every token. We're just um, changing the complexity of the model that's used below these uh, final two classifiers. Um, there's even more. There's this co-attention encoder that was proposed. Um, all, all of these, um, the advances pre-BERT were mainly focused on how can we develop the most powerful attention mechanisms to link the question and the paragraph as closely together as possible. And so by the end of 2016, we had several different models that were proposed to solve the squad task. Um, you can see here, uh, oh, I should mention how we evaluate these things. So um, assume that I have a model and my model produces some answer span given a question and a passage. And I also have a ground truth answer for that particular question. So let's say it's like in my test set. Um, what we do to get this F1 um, score is we look at the word level F1 um, from comparing the model's predicted answer to the um, ground truth answer. So basically, like how many words in the predicted answer were in the ground truth answer? You, intuitively, it's something like that. Um, so you can see that human performance on this task is really high. Um, almost always humans produce an answer that's either exactly identical to or very similar to the ground truth answer. Um, the EMs column here is exact match. So how often does the, the human in, in this row produce an answer that has the exact uh, same tokens in it, the exact same span as the ground truth answer? Um, so they do this 82% of the time. 
And uh, we see that these models are, they're not great, right? Uh, we have a logistic regression baseline, which was in the original paper that introduced the squad data set. Uh, this one doesn't have any neural network components at all associated with it. And it has an F1 score of about 51. And all of these subsequent models are using more and more complicated neural networks. They get to 67, 73, and so on. And um, importantly, all of these models are trained from scratch on the squad data set. The only thing they might be transferring over is uh, using pre-trained word embeddings, but all of the composition function parameters, like the recurrent parameters of the RNNs or LSTMs, all of these things are being trained from scratch using the squad error signal. Okay, so um, now let's move to how we use BERT to solve this task in, a, in actually a very clean manner with as few external parameters that are initialized randomly and trained from scratch as possible. Um, it is very simple. So I essentially just concatenate the uh, question and the paragraph together into a single sequence. Um, and they're separated by this special separator token. So if you look down here, you see token one through N, these are from the question. And we have token one through token M that are from the paragraph. And we have this special separator token to help the model distinguish them. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, now we just feed this entire concatenated sequence into BERT. So we get our, you know, our transformer layers. We have uh, tw 12 or 24 layers in between this yellow part and this green part. And then the final layer of BERT gives us uh, a single representation for every single word in this concatenated sequence. And we really only care about the paragraph, right? Because we know that the answer to this question is somewhere within this paragraph. So we simply just put our start and end classifiers on top of every single one of these final token representations that come from BERT, um, from the paragraph. And we do the exact same thing that we just went over from the previous models. Uh, we predict for every token, is it the start token or is it the end token? And at test time, we do the exact same thing of um, picking the span that has the highest product of start and end probabilities. Um, but you can see here that what have we actually transferred over from the pre-training phase? Literally everything in this blue box, right? All of the BERT parameters have been transferred over to our squad task. We're not learning any of these composition parameters from scratch. The only thing we're learning from scratch is the two classifiers, the softmax layers to predict the start and end of spin. Um, and you might be wondering, well, how does the model know like what the question is, right? Um, how does it do a tension between the question and the paragraph? But BERT naturally does this, right? It's a transformer, it uses self-attention. So every representation of the paragraph is attending over every token of the question. Um, remember, and we have multiple heads, they're able to look at different types of information. We have multiple layers, we're stacking this attention. So um, BERT already is a very, very powerful composition function. Um, and this simple setup, just applying BERT to the squad task, gives massive gains on um, squad, as we'll see here. So on 2019, um, when BERT came out and um, was uh, applied to a bunch of different tasks, you see the new leaderboard. So here is the same human performance of 82 exact match and 91 F1. And uh, the single model of BERT got even higher exact match than humans. Um, so it was 85% of the time it gave you the exact same uh, answer span as what was in the ground truth. And you can get even higher performance by ensembling many different BERT models together. So that, that means you just train up a bunch of BERTs that have start from different random initializations um, and you ensemble their predictions together, meaning you basically just average the uh, token level predictions of start and end span um, to uh, before you figure out what the final answer span is. So this is super impressive, right? We went from 
2016, end of 2016, we were in the 60s and 70s for exact match in F1 to uh, superhuman performance. Of course, there's a lot of hype with this um, result. People, there were some uninformed reporters writing articles like um, neural networks are better at answering questions than humans. Um, but now we, we should think back to the limitations of this data set, right? It assumes that the answer to the question is in this paragraph somewhere. It also assumes that the um, paragraph, the documents are it's like short paragraphs and the types of questions in it are not particularly interesting. They're mostly related to entities and um, relations of those entities. But still, it, it's an impressive technical result, right? Um, we, without doing any sort of QA specific modifications to the architecture, um, we made all of these fancier uh, QA architectures that have been proposed previously, like uh, all of these types of models with their numerous LSTM modules and attention modules. All those don't really matter once we have something like BERT, which has been pre-trained on an insane amount of unlabeled data, and its architecture is good enough to just solve squad without like all we're doing is concatenating the question and the paragraph together and passing it through BERT. Um, there's nothing complicated about this on the downstream tap side, but um, yeah, it, it achieves significantly better results. So now let's move on to a more challenging case and we're still gonna use our same squad setting. We have a question, the answer is, uh, and we have a, a paragraph. But um, in Squad 2.0, there's an additional quirk that some of the questions are unanswerable from the paragraph. So here I have this um, paragraph and my question, when did Genghis Khan kill Great Khan? Um, that question is not answered by this paragraph. And so we would like our model to predict no answer. And if you use an existing squad model, like one of these BERT models, because it was trained in a way that it has to produce the uh, some answer span, right? It has no way of telling you that they're, they're, the question is unanswerable. Um, this BERT model would produce some sort of answer. So like in this Microsoft and LNet, which is some BERT-like model, it's probably also BERT based on BERT that um, was done by Microsoft, not Google. This model predicted um, 1234, which is, you know, a pretty reasonable prediction given this paragraph, right? At least it gave us a, a year, a date, but um, this year is not associated with this question. Um, so even BERT, BERT can be um, uh, kind of very easily modified to support this no answer functionality. Uh, you could even just consider uh, adding a no answer token to your input and forcing the model to just predict that that, uh, that token is the start and end of the answer span. Um, you could also do things like if your span probability, the, the one that you find at uh, test time is, is, low, um, is lower than some threshold, then you can deem the um, answer to be, the question to be unanswerable. Um, so, here again, um, before BERT, so we see all of these um, entries on the squad leaderboard from 2018. Um, before BERT, we had uh, uh, all of these models that on squad 2.0 were getting uh, F1s somewhere in the uh, high 60s. And it was thought that, you know, this task might be challenging for BERT, right? It has to now learn whether or not a question is answerable or not. Um, but it turns out that it's not so challenging after all. I'm sure nowadays if we go to the um, Squad 2 leaderboard, I actually should have done this and uh, updated this slide, but uh, I think we're probably past human performance at, on this new task as well. But just look at the top uh, five or six models on this page. Literally all of them are using BERT in some, some way, right? So. Um, this just kind of underscores how influential this um, paradigm of transfer learning with large scale transformer language models has been to NLP. And these are huge improvements, right? 85, 87 compared to just a year prior. These were all the state of the art on this data set at some point. 
you even see the Elmo result here is just much worse. Um, so the combination of pre-training on a huge amount of data with a huge scale model is um, basically the, the recipe for success. Okay, but I mean, yeah, what does it actually mean to be better than humans, right? Is it really superhuman performance? Um, and no, it's not. And anyone who says so is, is just uninformed. Um, all of these systems, even the BERT ones, make still make dumb um, errors. So here um, you have this question about Chinese dynasties and it asks what dynasty came before the Yuan. And um, here we see in our paragraph in official Chinese histories, the Yuan dynasty bore the mandate of heaven following the Song dynasty and preceding the Min, Ming dynasty. So um, the question is what dynasty came before the Yuan? Uh, and the, the answer says it was preceded by the Ming dynasty, which is the answer to this question. But you notice that the, the wording here is slightly different, right? It doesn't explicitly say before the uh, Yuan. It, it says the Yuan preceded, preceded the Ming dynasty. So um, it's kind of swapped the order of the, uh, the two words. And this confuses the model. The model predicts uh, the Song Dynasty as the, the number one answer here, even though that's the, um, the dynasty that... Uh, oh god, this, this sentence is now confusing me. Um, following the... Wait. Uh, oh, sorry, I completely switched around the... Uh, right, so the correct answer is the Song Dynasty because it... Uh, okay, wow. I'm glad this was live. Um, yeah, so uh, I completely misread the sentence. But yeah, the correct answer is the Song Dynasty, and the model predicts, just like I stupidly did, the Ming Dynasty. So maybe this isn't such a dumb error. Um, it's hard for me to even read this sentence, honestly. Uh, but anyway, it makes, it makes errors like this, which are based on uh, you know, things like synonyms and syntactic structure differences between the um, question and the uh, text in the passage. And these models rely heavily on string overlap between the question and the um, paragraph. So uh, for, for questions that are more vague, that um, are maybe paraphrasing some text in the paragraph, uh, those tend to be harder for, for these models. Okay, so um, let's think about some other limitations of this, uh, this data set. Um, of course, all of the answers are spans, so you can't ask any questions like uh, yes or no questions or having a model count up different instances of a particular example or you know, ask why something happened um, unless that's easily answered by a span. Um, also, and we'll talk more about this later too, um, how do you actually create a data set like Squad. Uh, Squad was created through Amazon Mechanical Turk. So a bunch of um, crowd workers were given these Wikipedia passages and asked to write questions about them. So it wasn't a case where the people writing the questions actually wanted to know the answers. They were specifically told, look, we're creating this QA data set. We need you to write questions about this um, paragraph. But it's not a genuine need on the part of the person writing the question that they wanted to know the answer. Um, and some other data sets that we'll talk about a little later tackle this issue of the type of reasoning required to solve these squad style questions is um, very, very simple. So you barely need to model things beyond just a single sentence in the paragraph. That said, it's still been very useful, of course, at developing models, validating the effectiveness of models like BERT and so on. So it's a very influential um, data set in the grand scheme of not only just QA research, but also um, NLP research as a whole. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, a couple variants of the squad style setup that kind of address some of these limitations. Um, and one of them is conversational question answering. So here, and this is more getting to the application of, say, a conversational agent like an Alexa or something where you um, 
you ask the agent a bunch of different questions and um, they're all kind of related and getting at uh, the same overall topic or something like that. Um, and you might want to, as the person asking these questions, refer to previous answers or previous questions um, when you're asking them. So in this example, this is from the Quack data set, which uh, I actually helped collect. Um, these are dialogues that two Mechanical Turk workers had about um, a Wikipedia article. So this one's about the origin and history of Daffy Duck. And we might have questions like, what is the origin of Daffy Duck? What was he like in that episode? So you can see that the second question, this word he here is referring to Daffy Duck. So it's a co-reference. It's referring to something that was talked about in a previous question. Um, and uh, yeah, you can see here, why did they add the lisp? This lisp is a, a reference to the answer from the previous question. Um, this question is pretty interesting. Is there an unofficial story? It's in response to the previous answer, um, revealing that there is an official story in quotes, which kind of implies that there's a there's an unofficial story. So um, this kind of data set can also be solved by BERT style models. And the very naive, simple way that's also quite effective is just to stuff your context with previous questions and previous answers. Um, so you can imagine instead of including the just the current question in my input to BERT, I can concatenate the current question with all of the previous questions and their answers. Um, of course, this doesn't scale to settings where I have a very long dialogue. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it it's also not very satisfying from a modeling perspective. Maybe you want a model that can more intelligently uh, retrieve answers and uh, bits of previous questions. Um, but BERT style models still kind of dominate this uh, conversational QA uh, paradigm. And there are many other data sets that um, we can check out to, that you can check out if you're interested in this. Um, another type of QA data set that um, has been proposed kind of after uh, BERT solved squad is to get at the aspect of reasoning. So whatever your definition of reasoning is, um, it's kind of safe to assume that squad did not um, require a lot of complicated reasoning. And so data sets like Hot Pot QA and um, Kangaroo, I don't know how you're supposed to say that, Kangaroo, um, they, they're specifically built for multi-hop question answering. So um, I might have this paragraph uh, here, these two paragraphs where a model needs to kind of uh, represent both of these green highlighted spans of text um, and uh, learn to make the inference that um, Jane Eyre is the novel that's being discussed here and it was published under this pen name and Jane Eyre is also what this uh, telenovela um, is based on. Oh, sorry, the reverse. The telenovela is based on Jane Eyre. So when you get a question like this telenovela was based on a novel published under what pen name, the model has to integrate information from both of these green spans. Um, it can't answer this question based on just one of them alone. So that was the original motivation of these data sets. Since then, people have shown that data sets like Hot Pot QA aren't actually multi-hop. Like you can even get a model that produces uh, solid answers without having access to one of these paragraphs, but um, the intuition is there, right? Like you want to force the model to kind of um, make these multi-hop inferences rather than just kind of retrieving a single sentence. Um, and again, um, not to belabor the point, but your standard BERT style architecture can easily be used to solve this kind of task too, right? You can just concatenate both of the paragraphs together with the question and um, feed it through BERT. And this is still your same span style start and end prediction task. Okay, so some more interesting um, QA tasks, at least from, from my perspective, um, are long form QA, where the answers must be generated and not extracted from a document. So in these settings, 
um, like the previous, uh, the question that was asked before, um, we're not predicting a start or end span of the answer. Uh, we're rather um, trying to generate in a language modeling setting the words that make up the answer. So this example here is from uh, the ELI5 data set that Facebook released, which um, if you've gone to the explain like I'm five subreddit, uh, all of these questions and answers are from there. Uh, so here you get a question like, how do jellyfish function without brains or nervous systems? Um, and the data set also includes some supporting documents, although uh, they're different settings. So you can have models that don't have any access to supporting documents and must just from the question alone generate an answer. So this is an answer from the ELI5 subreddit. Um, but they, they provide these supporting documents so that you can also design models, conditional language models that um, can access the ground truth supporting documents to help them generate this answer. So we'll talk a little, little bit more about this kind of setup um, later on when we're talking about conditional text generation tasks. Um, but in the open domain setting, this is probably the most interesting um, future direction of question answering research is the model doesn't have access to any sort of supporting documents, um, like small set of supporting documents. So like in squad, we have a single paragraph. In this data set, we have a small collection of supporting documents. Um, but imagine you're given this question and um, your model is asked to just produce an answer. So you might want it to retrieve um, uh, relevant evidence over some large source of documents like Wikipedia or the common crawl. Um, but in contrast to the, the sort of pipeline system that I described earlier, um, in this setting, we might want a neural network to learn to, um, to retrieve relevant documents. Um, and we'll talk about several interesting variants of this neural retrieval setup um, to help uh, with uh, answer generation um, later on. Um, OK, so I think since it's been 57 minutes, I will stop here. I had a couple more fun slides, but um, they're not super important. So uh, I wanted to um, also briefly mention what we're going to be talking about on Monday. So I've this time at least managed to put the readings out um, for, for next time's uh, lecture, but we're going to be talking about, um, wait, where's the next slide here? Uh, we're going to be talking about how, so I've just described like a ton of different QA data, data sets and tasks and at their core, they're kind of similar, right? They require a model to understand a question, um, understand a collection of documents, retrieve relevant information from those documents, and either extract an answer or um, generate an answer. But you can imagine that a lot of the same kinds of reasoning is required to solve all of these tasks. And in general, this doesn't just apply to question answering, right? It could apply to text classification problems, maybe the same style of um, reasoning that's used to um, perform sentiment analysis can also help models that are trained on uh, like opinion mining or deception detection or various other um, text classification tasks. And so one very interesting, um, very new also line of work is um, not only transferring information from our language model to the downstream task, but also transferring information from models trained on other data sets in the same class as the current data set to our, the data set that we actually care about. So what this means is um, if I have uh, my target data set that I want to maximize my performance on is uh, squad, and I also have a model trained on hotpot QA, can I use my model trained on hotpot QA to get better performance on squad? So this is like another level of transfer learning beyond just transferring from language models or mask language models. Um, and this is a very promising direction moving forward because we now have many, many different QA data sets and classification data sets, sequence labeling data sets. Can we 
share information across all of these things to improve our performance. Um, so that's what we'll be focusing on for next time. And I will conclude there. I guess there were no more questions. If you have any more, please ask them on 